the game and the series, it's all over. How sweet it is. 60s drew to a close. The Pirates' last World Series championship team was a distant memory. Throughout the decade, the Pirates have been anchored by three future Hall of Famers, Bill Mazeroski, Willie Stargell, and Roberto Clemente. And yet that group had never been back to the postseason, and there was no real reason to believe that they were on the cusp of one of the greatest stretches in franchise history. After all, the Pirates thought the same things about themselves back in 1960. And Ralph Terry, of course, on the mound, will be facing Mazeroski. Here's a swing and a high fly ball going deep. We kind of thought we had a pretty good team and we could do this for two or three years in a row. We started off in 1961 winning our first 10 games. I said, ha ha, we're right back on track again. Then all hell broke loose. <laughs> for one thing, I had an off season, off year after the 59 and 60 season. I had an off year, I didn't have a good year. Uh, but I'm gonna take all the blame. <laughs> Law hurt his arm in 61, and that you're taking, you know, 15 or 20 games out of that. But uh, 62, we were we, we were right up in there. It just didn't happen. We weren't quite good enough, I guess. The other clubs beat us to the beat us to the punch. And the man entrusted with leading the Pirates back to greatness was General Manager Joe L. Brown. He was a guy that was, uh, he knew change had to come about as far as with the Pirate organization. And he took care of it. Something that had to be done. So, you know, and the group of guys I came with, he turned them loose. I think he was the best. The best I ever been around. Uh, and, and Primarily because of the fact that he would he would look at uh, different things uh, maybe differently than other general managers. He would go and ask ask some of the players about certain things, certain certain people, whatever. And uh, and also he would uh, he, he would be there if you have some personal problems. Some guys did were helped by. Him. Uh, have there been any things, any fundamentals, any team plays, for example, that you uh, want to do that we haven't done so far? Well, there's a couple of things, of course. Uh, Joe Brown, to me, was a guy that you could say I'm talk to. His door was always open. He was fair, and he was very direct in what he had to say. And you got to respect someone like that, because a lot of times, you know, you go, you go in and talk to a general manager, and they give you a whole lot of talk, but there, there's no value to it, no substance. To this day, I just think the world of Joe Brown. Uh, when I first signed, I weighed 150 pounds, 155 pounds. Joe Brown. True story, would slip me a $20 bill every once in a while, go get some milkshakes. Well then, when I got old enough to go from milkshakes to beer, you know, I could have used the 20, but he, he always looked after me. I wasn't a high round draft choice, one of those blue chippers or anything, uh, but he was, he was great to me. And then negotiating with him after I was having some good years, he'd been so nice to me, I couldn't argue with a guy. Brown had taken over the Pirates following the 1955 season when they were the worst team in baseball. It was a job that I wanted. I knew it would be a challenge, like every other job I ever had in baseball, bar none. When I got the job, I questioned myself whether I was good enough to be able to do the job. And after I did the job for a little while, I said, you're good enough. You know, what you have to do is work hard. I never, never thought at any time that I was smarter than the other people, but I knew that nobody would work harder. Brown also faced the daunting task of following in the footsteps of the immortal Branch Rickey. But he moved swiftly and boldly, adding the likes of Bill Verdon, Harvey Haddix, Smokey Burgess, and Don Hoke to his core of players. That team improbably won the 1960 World Series title, but Brown could see the team falling apart as early as 1961. And a sixth place club is not good. And uh, so I thought we had to do something about it. And I had confidence in our farm system, uh, perhaps a little too much. Some of those I thought were ready were not quite ready. And uh, it took a while for us to get back to where we were. But we made some, a lot of trades that uh, were not welcomed by anybody except the clubs that we made them with. 
And so Brown, who credits Ricky and his predecessor, Roy Hamey, for helping to build the 60 team, went back to work and soon put his own stamp on the franchise, implementing a system-wide way of playing baseball. What we tried to do was, was find out what the, the manager on the Major League Club, how he ran his club, the plays that he used, the rundowns and relays and things of that sort. And everybody did it the same way. We did it the Pittsburgh way. They're going to play for Pittsburgh. They're going to play the, the way that uh, they should, that will enable them to get there and stay there. Now just let her go on your back. See? You tuck this over a little bit more and tag with this. See? You'd be right, but that wasn't bad, Clyde. In uh, organizations, whereas uh, what they teach, like p pitchers fielding practice, uh, PFP we call it, if you took PFP with the Pirates as a rookie, they did the same thing in the big leagues. You know, whatever you learned in, 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 in the rookie league or A ball was throughout the organization. And the Pirates' farm system, run by Rex Bowen, began producing top-flight talent. And perhaps no one man had any more to do with the success of the Pirates over a good many years than Rex Bowen because he put together, I think, the greatest scouting organization that ever existed in baseball. Brown's men scouted the globe for talent, acquiring players regardless of race, creed, or color. That was the attitude of the of the organization. Our scouts were told, don't look at black players or don't look for black players, look for players. And we, they advanced as, whatever their racial antecedents were, they advanced as rapidly as they deserved, at least in the opinion of those people who's, who uh, made the decisions. And throughout the 1960s, that farm system spewed forth an amazing amount of talent. We had hitters all the way through the, the system. Uh, from A ball to triple A. When you saw the guys like Hebner and Robertson and Oliver and the young guys that could go out and hit the ball, they hit the ball with some power, it just, uh, you could see it developing. And when the young players arrived in Pittsburgh, they had the luxury of learning from three of the greatest players in Pittsburgh history. Bill Mazeroski, Willie Stargell, and Roberto Clemente. We had a three leader, Clemente, Willie, and Bill Maserowski that was there too, so we was having three, three really great guys. You had a black guy, Willie Stargell, a white guy, Bill Maserowski, and a Latin guy, Roberto Clemente. I mean, if you don't learn something from, from that trio about how to go about your business, how to approach your craft, uh, you ain't gonna learn. And I, when I joined that club, I, I, I went to the University of Baseball. Mazeroski was nearing the end of his prime by the late 1960s, but Stargell was just entering his, and he was developing as a leader as well. Good or bad, good games, bad games, uh, he always had a smile on his face. Uh, he was the guy you looked up for uh, when you were down the dumps. He was the one guy that, that could come to you or you could go and talk to him, and uh, he wouldn't sugarcoat it. He'd tell you exactly what he felt, what was on his mind, what he thought. He'd say, it's time to come together again. It's that time, we're losing it, we're losing it. It's just the way he would say those things, you know, with that little smirk. These were the things that Starter could do with people. That's how he led, not only on the field, but off the field. He knew how to deal with each individual, and that's what made him a great leader. But the unquestioned focal point of the team was Roberto Clemente, who was set to lead the team into a new stadium and a new era of greatness. As the late 1960s drew to a close, the Pirates were building a formidable team with a group of talented young players surrounding veterans like Mazeroski and Stargell and the unquestioned leader of the team, Roberto Clemente. Clemente was often misunderstood in his younger days by fans, the media, and opposing players. When I first played against him, I didn't like him, you know, because he, he, um, you know, was a very, very proud player and, and was fighting um, a lot of prejudice. Because was he black? But he also, you know, didn't speak English very well and he was also from another culture and. And so it was, um, it was difficult times for him. And he was trying to establish himself. He was a great player, 
uh, but wasn't getting the same recognition as all the superstars of the day that were winning batting titles, home run titles, the Mickey Mantles and the Willie Mazes and even Billy Williams and, and Ernie Banks in Chicago. But here he was as great a player and not getting the same recognition. So when he played, he played with a real ferocity and a reckless abandon to try and, and prove that he was as good as everyone else. He used to complain about things. Every day he'd complain about something. My wife's like that, but he played, and I never, all the games I saw him play, I never once saw him loaf. He had that ability to, when you watched him play, with his style of play, to turn a 10-year major league veteran and a 10-year-old kid. I mean, he was that much fun to watch. It almost seemed like Clemente kind of was above the fray. I mean, <laughs> he, he, he was so distinctive. Uh, you know, we were all kind of like soldiers. He was like kind of a general. I was traded to Pittsburgh and got to meet him on a daily basis, got to watch him play. And all of a sudden I said, boy, was I wrong. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know how great a player he was. I didn't realize that he had such incredible instincts. Uh, the sixth sense of where everything was, even when his back was to the infield. And um, when, when you put that sixth sense together with the great ability, magic happens. Established by the late 60s as a superstar and comfortable with himself, Clemente became the unquestioned leader of the Pirates. People related to him, he related to them, and it was just a nice time to, to be around a superstar like him. Beautiful leader. He never said anything wrong about any of the players. Every player, they used the Pittsburgh Pirate uniform with his best friend and loved everybody and then he was ready to defend each one of us. The first time I really made an error to lose the game with the Pirates, uh, after the game I started crying. And then Clemente saw me, he said, oh, no, no, wait a minute, give your head up. We don't do that here. We lose one and we win three. So he put the hand over my shoulder and he talked to me a lot and he picked me up strong. And from then on, you know, I started getting better and better and better. He was a guy that you looked up to. Uh, he was a father type figure and led by example on the field. When he hustled, you had to hustle. And that's what I really admired about him was his hustle and his feel for people. He loved people. As the 1970 season approached, Joe L. Brown knew he had a good team, but he didn't have a manager. His old friend Danny Murtaugh had twice managed the Pirates guiding them to the 1960 World Series title, but it stepped aside for health reasons. Brown asked Murtaugh for his advice during the winter and showed him his list of candidates. He says, how about me? I said, what do you mean? He says, how about me as a new manager? I said, Danny, you'd be my choice to manage any time, but uh, I'm going to have to have a letter or a conversation with and from your doctor. And not only that, Katie's got to give permission. He said, just a minute. He left, came back in. He said, just talk to Katie. She says, go ahead. The even-tempered Murtaugh was a perfect fit for the talented Pirates. The worst thing, I think, for a player is to have to be concerned when that manager walks in through the clubhouse door, okay, what's it going to be like today? You know, what's, what's going to go on today? Murtaugh laid out a, a real even line of stability, I thought, all the time. And I, I thought it was terrific. He's always a good player's manager. He didn't bother you. He sends you out there and lets you do your job. And you know your, knew what your job was with him. He didn't tell you that. And, and he was always honest with you, and that's all you can ask. And put me out there and let you play and do your job, you stay there. And looking back, I, I realized that he was a master at keeping his bench sharp. And I think that's one reason why uh, the bench did so well that year. I mean, he was never ill-prepared. He'd sit back there, but he knew what was going on all the time. I, I just thought the world of him. I, I thought he, was a, he was a nice man and, and a good manager. A lot of people mis, misrated, uh, underrated Dan. They thought, oh, he's just this wisecracking uh, Irishman who spat tobacco juice on people's feet and said, go ahead and play the game. But it wasn't that way at all. He never did anything without a good, solid reason. Brown added more talent for Murtaugh in the winter preceding the 1970 season. His intent was to add a starting pitcher, 
and he showed another side of his acumen by asking Roberto Clemente's advice about St. Louis right-hander Dave Justy. I asked Clemente, I said, how good is Justy? He says, he's tough against me. He says, if you get a chance to get him, get him. And of course, he came, came with us in spring training, he couldn't get anybody out. He was pitched well enough to make the club, but he just had a bad spring. Well, I don't think Danny knew, knew what the heck to do with me, to tell you the truth. Uh, I, I wasn't able to start because I didn't have the, the, the spring training that I should have had. So they put me in long relief, and I did pretty well for the first couple of, uh, of outings. And then there was an opportunity where Chuck Hardenstein, the, the, uh, the closer, uh, was on the shelf. So he put me into a game, and uh, from there, it was just kind of history there. And Justy filled a huge void, becoming a top-flight closer by the time the Pirates played their last game at venerable old Forbes Field. Ground ball, bouncing up the middle. Taken by Maz, he steps on second for the final putout in the history of Forbes Field. Forbes Field had served the Pirates well for over 60 seasons before the last game was played there on June 28th of 1970. Forbes had housed three Pirates World Series champions and two All-Star games, but it was time to give way to a new home, Three Rivers Stadium. I thought the move was uh, overdue for the simple reason everything in Forbes Field was outdated. Three Rivers was the new park, you know, like a new suit. You know, it was the, the, the end place. Danny, what do you think of the brand new house? Well, if I could use one word to describe it, Bill, I'd, I'd have to say it's awesome. It sure is, isn't it? It's, it's wonderful to see. Oh, I mean, I mean, we thought it was the Vatican. Yeah, as far as we were concerned, you know, I thought it was the greatest thing that, you know, um, a prayer could ask for. I don't think our feet ever touched the ground because it was a beautiful stadium, brand new. Nobody ever played there before but us. We had a big clubhouse, spacious. I mean, it was like uh, dying and going to heaven. We're going to have carpet in the clubhouse. We're going to have air conditioning. I mean, it's pretty, pretty special stuff. And there was a rumor around that we're going to get brand new type of uniforms, the double knits which were quite flattering to us skinny guys, but some of the other guys was not very flattering to at all, including our manager. Danny didn't really look all that good in the double knits. Clemente and I wore them in spring training to see what we thought of them, and only everything just stretched with you and was, fine. It was a lot lighter, didn't hold the sweat, and got heavy on you or nothing, and it was, it was perfect. We really liked them. We had guys on our team that was built, uh, you know, to wear those type of uniforms, so you had to be built to wear those kind of uniforms, and so we, so we enjoyed that. We're changing the game, okay? We're, we're going with a new uniform that's never been worn before. We're getting away from that hot wool stuff. We're putting on some light uh, polyester, stuff that's skin tight, and you know, we feel good. We were instrumental in a couple of things. New uniforms, and a new ballpark, very much uh, different than all the rest of them, and of course, a lot of the other ballparks kind of followed too with the multi-purpose stadiums. Oh yeah, we were definitely proud of Three Rivers. Oh yeah, you know it was, it was a good ballpark and, and it was a new stadium with a super team. That's what made it even more special. Three Rivers was a much better hitters park than Forbes Field had been, and that played to the Pirates' strengths. But as the 1970 season would prove, they weren't a super team just yet. The move from old Forbes Field to new Three Rivers suited the Pirates' powerful style of play, and the winning team brought out the best in legendary play-by-play -play man Bob Prince. Right now, Oliver is in a very key situation. Slow pause to the belt, the pitch, and there's a ball hit very deep to right field. You can't kiss it goodbye. Come on now, well, let's spread some chicken on the hill. Here comes the pitch. Dodge will swing, take on the long drive. Standing in. Arriba, arriba. And the big red fires. Bobby swings and hits a drive down the right field line. It's going, going, and you can kiss it goodbye. Oh, baby, did he hit that baby out of sight. Cremated it. And the Buckos. We had them all the way. 
Prince had first joined the Pirates broadcast team in 1947 and had become as closely associated with the team as any of its players through his uniquely flamboyant style. He got you involved emotionally with what was going on. You could picture it. He, he explained or described what was going on so well that you could see the guy chasing the ball down the outfield and the relay to the, the shortstop and short left field and the play at the home plate. And you could see it. You could see the dust come up and he just brought out pictures in your mind. When I came to the big leagues in 1964, one of the first things I tried to do was, was make sure I knew who Bob Prince was. And Bob Prince was maybe the face of the Pittsburgh Pirates in, in, in a certain way. Hey, you got a good change going today, huh? Just the right speed. Oh, yeah. Did you hear Lynch holler? He went, ow. Huh? I was looking at book and I saw him. I said, oh, man, look at Bob Prince. You can kiss and goodbye. I used to love that. And uh, we used to talk all the time, and he was a great guy to be around. I mean, he was a, a real great uh, sport commentators, and he get along good with all the players, too. Bob Prince was great. Bob Prince, um, of course, you know, he was a great personality. You know, everybody will always remember the sport coats, the pants that he wore. It's hard to describe he, he, his, his attire. It was bright and just like his conversation over the air, you know, it was right at you. So Torrio, elegant, you know, I would put it, because he had some weird outfits, you know what I mean? <laughs> but he was always with the players, and uh, it, we, he ran around with us on the road just like he was one of the players, and we almost, we always accepted him just like that, because he was part of the team. Bob Prince could work into a, walk into a boardroom U.S. Steel or the back room of the West Mifflin Fire Department, and he would own the room, either either scenario. I've never seen anybody with those kind of abilities. I'll tell you a story about Bob Prince. He would we'd be chartering planes during the season, and Danny Murtaugh used to read these cowboy books. It'd take you an hour and a half to read 100 pages. Danny would fall asleep in the front of the plane, you know, like doze off, and Prince would come up the front, front of the playing and take the book out of Murtaugh's hand and rip the last 10 pages out of the book. Well, Danny would wake up and go, you son of a gun, Prince, what did you do? He'd do it all the time. Murtaugh would get the end of the book and this, the last 10 pages are ripped out. But that's the way Prince is. You don't do that. If you do that now in baseball, you have fights. Back then, Prince and Jim Woods, his partner, they were a character. They were part of the team, really. He was a Pittsburgh Pirate in the broadcast booth. That's the best way I can sum Bob Prince up. He was good for the game. He was good for the Pirates. And with Prince behind the mic and the team in their new home, the Pirates finally delivered on their promise, winning the NL East title before being swept in the National League Championship Series by the Cincinnati Reds. But even in defeat, the Pirates knew they were close to something special. The 70 team was like a stepping stone, like uh, the debutantes coming out and showing that this club is going to be uh, a good club for, for a lot of years because of what kind of personnel we had. Winning in 1970 gave us more confidence. And we were already confident, but we were more confident than ever in 1971. But Joel Brown felt the team needed help, and so he swung two trades in the offseason, acquiring starting pitcher Bob Johnson, who the Pirates thought could be a star, and a reserve infielder named Jackie Hernandez from Kansas City. Well, I know that there was one of the best hitting in baseball, and uh, and right there I know that was going to help me because I I never been a good hitter. I used my glove and uh, steal bases and bunt and all that, but I never could hit uh, close to 300. So I know to get into that team, it's so much hitting. Uh, they weren't going to gonna worry about me hitting so much, and uh, it helped me a lot. Uh, he made me a much better ball player. And in another deal, the Pirates grabbed pitcher Nellie Bryles from St. Louis for former batting champ Matty Alou. That deal not only strengthened the Pirates' pitching, but also freed up playing time for Bob Robertson and Al Oliver, who'd been platooning at first base. I had a, um, a rival in Bob Robertson. You know, the question was what the Pirates were going to do with Bob Robertson and Al Oliver. You know, we both were the same age and everything, and you know, we, we both could play, but it, it was only one position. One of us wanted to be platoon. He's the one who had to make the change. 
Because where, where are they going to put me? Third? Or heaven is a third. You had Dagon a third. You know, I did play a little left, left field, but not much. There wasn't really any other place that I could go. So I think it worked out good. And I think uh, because of Al made that transfer from first base to the outfield, just made us a better, stronger ball club. Matty was a fine hitter, but he didn't drive in, in any runs, and he wasn't an outstanding outfielder. So if we could pick up another starter, which we got in Bryles, I thought we ought to do it. One other significant move would take place in 1971 with Dave Cash easing Bill Mazeroski out of the lineup at second base. You know it's getting to be time to hang him up, so I, don't, I, I couldn't have played every day then anyhow. I was be getting hurt every other day or something, pulling a muscle or doing something. Bill was uh, about 10 years older than I was, so I, all I had to do was just be patient and not, you know, to wish any bad luck on Bill, because me and Bill have been great friends for a number of years. But I knew I was going to get an opportunity to play. If I had it came along 10 years earlier, I might have been in trouble. Dave Cash, I think, will be a major league manager someday with his baseball instincts. He had a real good sense of the game. And uh, he did a good job, because everybody's wondering what's going to happen after Maz. And uh, he, he made it easier for all of us. And with the lineup and rotation in place, the Pirates were ready to conquer the National League. As spring training began in 1971, the Baltimore Orioles were the prohibitive favorite to win the World Series. They'd been to the series in 69, they'd won it in 1970, and felt with some justification that they were the best team in baseball. Well, you go into each year and knowing that you've got, a, you've got pretty much all the parts, a good defense, good offense, Good pitching, uh, good bullpen, so you know, we were looking forward to, to winning again. We felt going in to spring training that we had a chance to win because then the other clubs had really improved themselves that much. And we felt we had a great chance of uh, winning again. The 71, we felt like we could repeat because, uh, you know, when, when you get in the World Series, you have the kind of talent we had on that ball club. Uh, you certainly want to repeat and, and show people that you have great talent. We had a real nice nucleus of a good ball club, and we'd just gotten uh, Pat Dobson. We were good. We were, we were a damn good ball club. And coming off their first playoff appearance in a decade, the Pirates were confident, too. When I joined the club in 1971 in spring training, I could tell that there was a focus. There was a determination that there was a lot of business, you know, undone. We were good. We had, uh, you know, I already had a year in the big league, Sanguin, all of the three rookies. You know, we got Gene Ayler, we got a good double play combination. It's Stodge and Clemente, uh, had good pitching. Uh, yeah, I think when you win, it gets contagious. I remember those days where guys, you know, if they made it out in spring training, it would, it, it would just be like it would be the middle of the season. We just didn't want to make out, so that's just the way it was. And that, that just pulled us all together, and we just wanted to go kick butt. In spring training, we had guys who were, were being platooned, but everybody set that aside for one reason. Stats didn't matter. What did matter was bringing the World Championship back to Pittsburgh. We felt like we had a chance to win everything in 71. Pirates played well in April and May, but not well enough to be in first place. The first part of the season, we didn't play particularly well. But then things just started to gel, and you started to win series two out of three, three out of four. The Pirates, though, had lost two straight and had slipped into third place when they visited first place St. Louis for a four-game series in mid-June. I think the Cardinals was, uh, they had a real good ball club that year, you know, and, uh, um, we knew we had our work cut out for us. They built their club uh, on the same basis of the Pirate team. They had speed, they had power, and they had good pitching. You know, and they, they, they played on AstroTurf, and they, they had the same kind of a club that we had. Uh, and they, they, could, they could score runs in bunches. They could have a big, they could put a six spot on you in a hurry. Just like, you know, the Pirates, you walk a couple guys, a couple gets the base hit, and next thing you know, bang, somebody hits one deep and you're down five. 
we felt that, that they were the team that we would be competing with. We always felt that we were the team that was going to win. That, that, you know, that's the kind of confidence we all had as a team. We were in first place when the Pirates came to town. And playing them a poor game set, the whole idea in a poor game set is split with the other team. That way no, no one is creeping up on you. No ground is lost. The only thing you've done, take a few games off the schedule, at least four games. Uh, we didn't expect to get swept by the, by the Pirate, but we were swept. That, that was a big series, you know, and uh, we could have just split with them. And, you know, you don't like to split at home, but when you can take three out of four, but when you're uh, the visitors and come in and you beat them all, beat them four in a row, that's pretty tough. And, you know, it's going to knock you back a little bit. Pirates had an interesting type of a ball club starting June. Those guys that caught fire. The whole idea was to get out in front and make them sweat trying to catch you. Uh, they didn't have a problem catching anyone. The Pirates vaulted into first place after the sweep, and they led the NL East every day for the rest of the season. I don't remember any uh, any real uh, serious doubts that we weren't going to do well. Our little motto, I don't know if you can say this on the air, was kick ass and take names. Let's go. And that's the way we kind of looked, you know, they said, I can hear the other teams, look at them, just look at them, they don't even look like ball players. Yeah, but when, they, when the game starts, you can get your ass kicked. We just uh, annihilated a lot of people. In the games that we seem to have lost, we lost by some fluke or somebody was hurt or something. Uh, you know, we, we just felt that we were going to go to the, at least the playoffs and, and, and probably the World Series that year. But as good as the Pirates were, the Orioles were even better. They were in first place in the AL East from June 5th through the end of the season. We thought that Boston would give us a real good run for it. But about July, we started spreading out, spacing everyone else out. I remember the last, uh, going into September, we had a, a nice, comfortable lead, and all we were worried about was not getting hurt. And our staff was so outstanding that year there. We had uh, four 20-game winners. Palmer, McNally, Quayer, and Pat Dobson. Uh, and I was the fifth starter. I mean, complete games, we, we had to throw BP to get our work in because uh, there were so many complete games. Once you got past the seventh inning, we probably could have went to the shower. You know, would even have missed this. <laughs> you know, going into September, you could you could look around, you could look, and there wasn't nobody going to catch us. I mean, we were just good. That's all there was. Steelers fans have more to cheer about with the opening of the 5th Sideline Store in the South Hills Village Mall. Now you can find all your favorite jerseys, hats, ladies apparel, and much more. The Steelers Sideline Stores are also located in the Monroeville Mall, the Pittsburgh Mills Mall, Grove City Outlets, and inside Heinz Field. Show off your Steelers pride with something special at one of the five Sideline Stores. So get off the sideline and into the action at one of the five Steelers Sideline locations. This summer, America's favorite family <gasps> hits the big screen. <laughs> On July 27th. Run! Run! Jump! Jump! Rest! Rest! Now I know we've had a rough day, but I'm sure we can put all that behind us. A secret will be revealed. Like a dad. You can see the one. The Vietnam War was raging and several of the pirates were serving in the armed forces reserves. Guys were going to Vietnam. I mean, the Vietnam War was was going on and stuff like that, and uh, they were guys were getting drafted, and we finally had an opportunity to go into reserves and still play. So I, I chose to take that route. I was in Salem, Virginia, in 1966. Joe Brown comes down and says to me, "Next week at this time, you're gonna be in Paris Island." I went, "Okay." Whoa, you've been to Paris Island? I've been. In I get down to Paris Island. I said, "What the hell am I doing here?" I think, I think every ball player should go to Paris Island, believe me. It was a 16-month uh, tough, tough grind. And uh, Bob Moose and I did it, and then I come out, and then I had to do five-and-a-half-year reserve. So I missed a lot of games in that five-and-a-half-year reserve, but uh, I guess it was better than Vietnam. I left the club Friday and would go to, I was in the Marine Corps, and go to uh, weekend duty. We missed some games on the weekend. That was tough. 
you know, but uh, here in the games, you know, we was out in the woods or whatever we was doing, and here our teammates was in here, in there playing some ball, and we had to do it, but that's, that's what we chose to do. And then and I had to go to summer camp, which is a two-week session. One year I went to California, next year I went to North Carolina, but I would miss two weeks of the baseball season right in the middle of the baseball season serving the military. I'll tell you what, if it wouldn't have been for baseball, I would have, uh, I would have stayed in the Marine Corps. I, I liked it. We probably lost about 12, 15 kids from Nord, Mass, where I live in the Vietnam War, and we only had like 30,000 people in that town, so no. I could care less about missing a the game. There were some guys over there hoping they were missing some bullets. The absence of some players for their military duty left holes in the lineup for others, like Gene Kleins, Jose Pagan, and Vic Davalio, who were eager to fill those holes. We had some utility players that didn't play every, every day, could have played regular on some other team. So we had the combination of uh, you want to give Clemente a rest or, or Willie a rest or whatever, you had somebody to step up and, and go in there and play in their place and do a real good job. Nobody wanted to sit down. Now see, Willie and Roberto were safe. Well see, I did not want to sit down. Because see, you put Gene Kleins out there, he's not going to stop hitting. It doesn't matter if Danny Murtaugh taking them out. Because you put one person in there, that's it. We all could hit. Every guy on that team thought he was the best player in the league, okay? He might not have been, but inside his mind, each player on that team thought he was the best player to ever walk on the field. And that's the kind of attitude you have to have to be successful. And that success helped to breed a boisterous and joyous clubhouse. We had black, we had white, we had Latin, we'd get on each other. Uh, it, was, it was just a mixture of a lot of happy players. Of course, then again, when you win, players are happy. When you lose, then you have some friction. But we had some crazy guys in that clubhouse who do some crazy, crazy things. And Murtaugh would just look back and go, oh, God. Well, it was uh, kind of crazy at times. Uh, you know, when you get a team that wins together like that, and uh, there's a lot of uh, kibitzing going back and forth. I couldn't wait to get to the clubhouse because I knew there was going to be something exciting going on. A little short story, Vic Davalio was on the team. And Vic used to practice voodoo. So he brought in two live chickens. He was going to sacrifice the chickens in the, in the clubhouse, and Murtaugh would have none of it. You know, it was, it was crazy. <laughs> and Doc Ellis was frequently at the center of the clubhouse craziness. Doc Ellis was probably the best clubhouse lawyer that I've ever played with. Doc could stir up some stuff. You know, just being Doc. He drove into spring training with some kind of Cadillac that had a belt around the top of the top of the engine area. I, I don't even know what it was. El Caballero. You know, I, I, I traded a Mercedes to get it. You know, I was with Starjo and Starjo said, Rumi, that's your car right there. I said, but Rumi, I'm in a brand new Mercedes. He said, but that Cadillac is yours. I pulled in and got it. <laughs> and he had all the double nets. He had all the new styles and the, the doctor. He didn't like to have anything to standardize. <laughs> he liked to, he liked to do his thing his, his, own, his own way. One day I can re recall where where he went to the ballpark and he had curlers in his hair in Chicago. And of course, he'll probably tell you the story. Well, uh, that was the fad back then. I mean, you know, that was the thing to do. I remember the time when uh, Muhammad Ali came into the clubhouse and uh, Doc Ellis could, could talk like him. And, and when those two got together, they started sparring around there and Doc said, I'm the prettiest. And, and Clay said he's the prettiest and that kind of stuff. It was a fun day because now the guys knew, they knew I could really box. Because they got to see me, until he started poking me in the chest. He, looked, he was a little quicker than I. No one could have pulled that off of Doc Yellis. I mean, these are things that Doc did. I mean, Doc was just great in the clubhouse and he was just great for us. You know, he couldn't have fit with anybody else in Major League Baseball but the Pirates. <laughs> Steve Blass was another who kept the Pirates' clubhouse fun. He and I were roommates for about three, four years, and uh, what an experience. You know, he, he's, uh, he's something, he's the funniest man I've ever met. You get ready to take the field, and you stick your hand in your glove that shaving cream, and you have no clue who did it. You would think Steve Blass would have been the last guy to ever do something like that. Steve was slick and sneaky with his... Ambits. Great guy. 
Before we get on spin training in 71, we had a big table in the middle of the, the, the clubhouse. He get up after doing show like a go-go show. <laughs> he don't even know how to dance, but we all was in the floor laughing. It was beautiful. I can remember him underneath the, in the training room when the lights were down a little bit and Clemente was on the training table and Tony Bartiron working on Clemente. And, and he'd be underneath the table and he'd make some crack about his shoulder or something. Remember Mission Impossible? I said, Good morning, Mr. Clemente. This is your neck. You know, Tony's working on his neck. I said, your assignment tonight is to double twice off Jack Bellingham and throw three men out at third base. If you or any of the derelicts you work with are discovered, I will disavow any knowledge of this tape. <laughs> yeah, and I, he, he'd be up there. <laughs> I could tell he was laughing. And Clemente would just sit there, lay there and laugh. And That was a crazy team. One night, I, uh, when Clemente jumped off the table two minutes before the anthem, it's the only time an anthem has been held up for a player because he jumps off of the table and I had taken his uniform out of his locker. <laughs> so he's standing in his shorts, they're getting ready to play the anthem, and they got no right fielder. <laughs> Clemente kept to himself earlier in his career but was willing to be part of the fun by 1971. Justy would walk in and he'd stand next to the table and wait a while, and Clemente knew he was there, you know. And, and, uh, all of a sudden, Justin, Justy would say to me, well, Tony, what's wrong with him today? And that would start it. He'd jump off that table and start screaming, and Ed scream. He would scream at, at Justy, and, and, and Justy's talking to him in Italian, and he's talking Spanish, and they're, they both are talking different languages, and that's when they seem to agree. You know, once the bell rang, once the game started, we played good, and afterwards we, we joked around. There's a lot of closeness, and there, nowadays in the big leagues, it's like, I don't know, I think the almighty dollar ruins a lot of things. You know, I can't picture some guys making $10 million a year. If I seen all those circles, I, I think I might pass out. But back then it was just, we weren't making much money. We were having fun. It was a fun, it was a fun game where you played when you are little league, now I'm in the big leagues, I'm getting, I'm getting paid for it. It's not bad, is it? To me, chemistry is, is a wonderful thing, and it's a, it's a great thing when you win. I, I think if you have chemistry when you lose, it's, there's something very wrong. Good chemistry on a losing team is cancer. Uh, but these, these guys, they, we'd scream at each other and holler and everything. And it was just kind of a way to blow off steam. But the, each and every one of those guys wanted to win. And uh, it, was, it, was just, it was just a great theme. It was just a great push going forward. And as the 1971 Pirates went forward, they were about to make history in more ways than one. September 1st, 1971. In an otherwise nondescript game against the Philadelphia Phillies, the Pirates quietly made history by fielding the first starting nine comprised entirely of minority players. I had no clue because usually we sent five, six brothers out there anyway. The thing that really stood, stood out in my mind the most was uh, when I got to the ballpark early that afternoon, what the, the bad boy said to me, he mentioned that afternoon the Homestead Grays were in town, and I, I didn't know what he's talking about. And, and then as you know, the afternoon went on, I'm out in center field, National Anthem, I'm thinking about what this kid had said. I looked to my right, there's Clemente, I looked to my, my left, there's Stargell, then I turned around, looked at that, the entire infield, and said, oh my God, you know, there's something special going on here. No one realize what was going on or what was happening until about the second and the third inning. You know, we look out and we see and somebody, uh, either Al or Gene, said, hey, man, there's nine black players on the team. And by the fourth or fifth inning, we were in the dugout, I asked Dave Cash, I, you know, I missed the Dave. I said, Dave, you know, we got all brothers out there, man. And he said, sure do. I said, yeah, we all brothers. <laughs> And that right away, I know we don't going to lose. <laughs> when I noticed it, uh, the umpire was calling strikes down the middle balls. And the first thing I said, he's doing this on purpose. But they took me out of the game and put in Bob Bill, so now they're in trouble. We went out and waxed Philadelphia that, that day, too. I think uh, we put a pretty good shellacking on them. <laughs> Then it's called four wrong, and we come back, it's called five wrong. And then everybody calling it bingo long place. <laughs> For the players on baseball's most integrated team, 
There was surprise afterwards that this had been their first all-minority starting lineup. I didn't know about it until I read it in the paper the next day. I, I'm being honest as a judge. It, it wasn't very uh, noticeable to me, uh, and, uh, and probably not a lot of other guys either. You know, it was just one of those things that happened. You know, we didn't we didn't think of it that way. You know, we think, hey, there's nine baseball players out there, and 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 it it was true. I mean, we there were, we actually started started nine black players at one time, something that you'll probably never see again. And then after the when the we the ball game was over, Clemente called me, explained to me, and said, never in the life it was nine people, black people playing baseball like that in the big league. So then I want to stand a little more. But I, to me, it was nothing. I'm just going to play ball. <laughs> One last question hung in the air. Did manager Danny Murtaugh purposely field an all-minority team? Some say that he wasn't smart enough to do it on purpose. <laughs> I've heard that from some players. But I really believe that he did not do it on purpose. It just happened to turn out that way. When they go to Danny Murtaugh, and they asked him why he got nine guys playing, nine black guys playing. He said, I don't see nine guy, black guys. I see nine pirate players out there. They talked to Danny Murtaugh about that situation. And, you know, his answer was, I put the nine best ball players out there I, that, I, that night that I thought was going to win for me. So it just happened to be nine black and Latin ball players that started that lineup. Murtaugh didn't even know it. He wrote the lineup up, and, and somebody pointed it out to him. I didn't know. And I, I, was, I, was, I was surprised. But that was the day that they uh, really broke the color line. I think it epitomized what our organization was all about. If you're good enough, you play. Not what you look like or where you came from or where you went to church. If you're good enough, you play. So that's the American way. That's what our Constitution says. Baseball follow it. As the rest of the month wore on, it became clear that the Pirates would make history of another kind by winning their second consecutive NL East title. We won a lot of games early when September came. You know, we, we didn't really play five and we played better than that, but we could have played 15 and 15 in September and still won by six or seven games. That's a nice comfortable lead to have. The inevitable happened on September 22nd in St. Louis when the Pirates clinched the NL East title by beating Bob Gibson and the Cardinals. I had two hits off of Gibson. That was rare and in between. Because he was the toughest right-handed pitcher I ever faced, but uh, we was lucky enough to get on him quick that night. And I remember Justy coming over, jumping around, yeah. I think he said a few things in Italian. I couldn't understand him. That was something special. I mean, it was the first time that, that all of us as a group had ever um, were part of a championship team. And uh, it was a very special moment. I think uh, we kind of raised the roof a little bit that night. I remember uh, playing the next day after it was clinched was a day game in St. Louis and pretty darn hot. And I remember sweating it out that day a little bit. Meanwhile, the Dodgers and Giants were sweating out the NL West race, which the Giants won on the last day of the regular season. The same Giants team which had beaten the Pirates in nine of 12 games in 1971. The Giants used to beat us all the time in the regular season, all the time. They had Marichal, they had Perry, they had McCovey. They had a good club. And we only beat them three out of 12 times that year. Well, we knew we had to play good baseball because they were a good team. And they, they were a very powerful offensive club. Plus, they had Juan Marichal, Gaylord Perry, and Mike McCormick, probably three of the top pitchers in the league that we had to go up against. Plus, they had a dynamite bullpen. They had, uh... McCovey and Marischal and Gaylord Perry, I mean, they were, they were good or they wouldn't have got to where they were. But I don't think we looked at it that way as much as that we knew we were real good and we knew that we were capable. We had our own, own guys uh, the, to match those guys and we just thought as a team that, that uh, uh, we were very confident. Oh yeah, I felt good, I felt good. We, we, our, our team was, we were cocky. But the Giants were confident, too, and they quickly showed the Pirates that winning the NLCS would not be easy. The Pirates opened the NLCS in San Francisco against the Giants, a team that had owned them in the regular season. And the Giants were able to beat Steve Blass and the Bucks 5-4 in game one. And I still think 
that I went into that first game thinking, okay, it's postseason. I got to be better than I was because it's a different elevation of, of the game. And I had nine strikeouts in, in five innings, which is not my game at all. McCovey hit the longest home run I ever see in San Francisco. I was behind the home plate when they hit the slider steer. I said, Steer, he take you to Tokyo. <laughs> But it was no laughing matter when Doc Ellis took the mound for the second game at Candlestick Park. Everybody was talking about Marshall and Gaylord and McCovey and all this other stuff. And man, uh -uh. No. We were going to beat them no matter what. Ellis was helped by Bob Robertson's NLCS record, three home runs. We're game down. We got to go. It's just as simple as that. We don't want to lose another one. And I think the attitude that I took into that game was to get a pitch and hit it hard. Hit it, make something happen, hit it hard someplace. And with the series tied at one and now back in Pittsburgh, an unlikely hero emerged, emergency starter Bob Johnson. I, my hats were off to, off to Bob Johnson because he did a heck of a job on a short notice. Nellie Bryles could not go and had warmed up, couldn't go. Bob Johnson, just a, a kind of a journeyman guy at that point, had the game of his life, beat Marichal 2-1. to one. Bob Johnson almost pitched a perfect game. I mean, he was right on the black the whole time, just uh, just perfectly pitched game. And uh, then it came my turn. I said, I don't want to screw this up. I just was focused to try to throw to their weaknesses and, uh, and, and just pitch like I usually pitch. And, and it worked out well. Bob Robertson started the scoring with a solo homer in the second off Marichal. That was a big thrill then because, see, that got us started. When the ball looks that big around, sometimes it looks that big around, sometimes it looks like that. Well, doing them playoffs and stuff, it looked about like that. And it just so happens that there it was, and it swung, and the way it went. And Richie Hebner's solo shot in the eighth proved to be the game winner. Yeah, hit a, I don't know what I hit, but it went over the fence, and it was a 2-1 game we win, and we're up two games to one. It was, it was pretty thrilling. I was 22, 23 years old, God, 50,000 people in the stands, I hit a home run, we win the game. Glass was knocked around again in game four, but Dave Cash started things off on a positive note in the first inning off Gaylord Perry. Well, I hit a ball that hit him in his leg, and a ball went all the way into the dugout, you know. The thing about, well, the thing that, that kind of upset me a little bit is that he didn't even, he didn't even rub it, you know? <laughs> he acted like it didn't even hurt, and I hit it pretty good. I mean, as a matter of fact, I hit it so hard where it blanched off his leg and went right in the dugout. And he acted like I didn't even, you know, I kind of stand. I feel kind of bad here. <laughs> Man didn't even rub it. <laughs> he didn't even call a trainer out. <laughs> Roberto Clemente drove cash in and had another big day at the plate. Robbie gave us whatever we needed. If we need a single, he could do that. If we need to hit a double, he would do that. If we needed a home run, a three-run homer, he could do that. He had, he, he was a five-tool guy and one of the top players that's ever played this game. Clemente got it started, but Richie Hebner and Al Oliver finished it off with a pair of three-run homers. And I never forget Richie Hebner hitting a home run that put us up, one run. Perry says, you must, I guess that spitball didn't go as like I wanted to, but uh, but I remember that was a, that was a big three-run homer. And I never forget, Roberto was on base, and they walked Stargell to get to me. They took Gaylord Perry out and brought in a hard-throwing right-hander named Jerry Johnson. And the first pitch he threw me, it was a home run. I didn't know for sure if it was going out. I know Bobby Bonds was backing up slowly. And I saw him up against the fence, and he couldn't go back any further. And rookie Bruce Keeson came on to pitch four and two-thirds innings of scoreless relief before Danny Murtaugh went to closer Dave Justy. I said, OK, the kid's done enough now. All right, let's get a varsity guy in there, and let's turn the ball over to Justy. All I was thinking about was outs. You know, I kept counting it, and it seemed like it was forever. We needed seven outs, we needed six outs, we needed five outs, and it was just, it seemed like time was going in slow motion. But finally, Justy got Bobby Bonds to ground out to third 
and the Pirates were going to the World Series. It's like Christmas, the Tooth Fairy, <laughs> and anything else you want to imagine. I mean, it, you feel a, a sense of accomplishment and a sense of pride. It was a big time celebration. I remember Bob Veal picking me up and carrying me around the locker room like I was a piece of paper. I remember Bing Crosby was in the clubhouse. Uh, I'm looking at Bing Crosby. Well, that's Bing Crosby. Wow, there was a lot of there was a lot of big shots. It's funny when you win, you get a lot of front runners come out of the closet. You know, I guess they like to be around winners too. <laughs> All hell breaks loose. You can't wait to pour champagne on everybody. I mean, you dream about this when you're a kid. You, you think, how how can I get there? You know, and, and, and finally you're there, and you're going to the World Series. Oh my goodness, I mean, that just is amazing. It's a, it's a dream. I mean, you, you think about that when you're eight or ten years old and, and you're playing out in the backyard or up against the, the barn and, and you're creating these fantasy games. And you, you dream, what am I going to do if I'm on the mound in, in the seventh game of the World Series in the bottom of the ninth? You know, I'm going to get the out. Am I going to go crazy? And you, you do all those things when you're ten years old. And if you're real, real lucky, you get to do them again when you're 29. And Blass had no idea how prophetic those childhood dreams would turn out to be. The Orioles blazed into the World Series on a 14-game winning streak. They won their last 11 regular season games before sweeping the Oakland A's in the ALCS. They led the American League in runs scored, and each of their four starters won at least 20 games. They were also appearing in their third straight World Series, having won it the year before. Yeah, world champions, uh, I mean, four 20-game winners, solid. I mean, solid and then some. Nobody thought we were going to beat them because of the pitching stuff they have. Four 20-game winners, Fran Robinson, Blue Power, uh, Paul Blair, all those guys hitting 300. A phenomenal group of uh, professionals, uh, guys that had experience and had been through several World, World Series themselves, so we had, we had our work cut out for us. As it got closer to, to the opening day of the World Series, you think, how in the hell are we going to beat this club? The Pirates were a great team, a great uh, outstanding hitting team more than anything else. So they had a good ball club, so you never take anyone lightly, although we went in with confidence thinking that we were going to win. I had the confidence that we will, we would have won, but I didn't think we would come, come over here and swept them. I didn't think it was all possible at all. The Pirates had plenty of extra motivation, though, including some comments made by Orioles manager Earl Weaver. Earl Weaver said, with Jackie Hernandez, you can't win the World Series. And I still keep the, uh, the newspaper clip uh, where he says uh, to Danny Murray that they're never going to win with me and shortstop and all that garbage. I just still don't know why, because he do not know me. Some comments by the press also upset the Pirates. It said one most newspaper, it may be Baltimore in three. Well, Murtaugh got a hold of that and put it in our locker room. And, and that's, the thing, that's the kind of the thing that, that Murtaugh would do, just little things that it made you think. So we kind of took offense to that, and I took offense to it not only before, during the series, it still bothers me to this day. Bottom line, what he's saying is that the Pirates shouldn't even bother showing up. I remember one day in the paper, and I'm not sure which paper it was, because we opened up in, in uh, Baltimore, that they had a position by position, and they had every guy on their team, they gave the edge over the guys on our team. Frank Robinson indicated to the press that he was going to put a clinic on and show Clemente how to play right field. Well, that angered Clemente, and I think Clemente switched roles, so that kind of uh, was a catalyst to Clemente to go out and play a little harder, which he did. But the Pirates had their usual self-confidence. We felt that we were underdogs, but we felt that we, we were, you know, we were confident enough that we're going to make a good showing. I am of the belief that good pitching does stop good hitting, but it doesn't necessarily stop great hitting. We have some great hitters. Bring them on, let's go, because they're going to they're gonna face the Buckos. And they knew what they was getting into. We didn't care if they won 20 or 
40 or how many games they, they that was against those other guys that they beat. <laughs> they didn't beat us yet. And that's the way we felt about it. That's the attitude that we took into the game. I mean, you got to be, you, you got to beat us. You haven't beat us yet. You might have beat the other team. Well, that's why we're here. We're here to find out who's the best team in 1971 between the National and the American League. And uh, it didn't look too good for us for the first couple of games. <laughs> Doc Ellis started game one in Baltimore for the Bucks. His 19 wins led the team in the regular season, but he squandered a 3-0 lead and left after two and a third innings, trailing 4-3. Like Murtaugh, he said, uh, do it. Just go to your fall, you know. I fell early. <laughs> he had a sore elbow. Like he never take care the whole year and then he get tired. And then the elbow start to have a sore elbow. That's what happened, the elbow hurts. Ellis, in fact, did not pitch again in the series because of his elbow. His counterpart in game one, Dave McNally, was sharp, allowing three unearned runs on just three hits while striking out nine. He had a mental toughness that was stronger than all other, the other three guys uh, on the mound. And I remember him coming back to the dugout and making fun of himself, you know, talking about the Pirates and how he was knocking them around. And, and he, he was laughing. He sat around laughing. And then we knew he was okay. Because once he started kidding around about it, we knew that deep down he was at a calm. It was 5-3 in the ninth inning when Al Oliver, who didn't start against the left-handed McNally, was called upon to pinch hit with two out in the ninth. Here's Dave McNally, who I couldn't start against, but I could pinch hit against. So I couldn't get that one. It was strange to go up there and make, make the last out of the, of the first game. But it really didn't bother me, being that it was the first game. If that had been the last game, it had been a whole new story. Unfortunately for the Pirates, it was the same old story in game two. An 11-3 Orioles win behind the pitching of Jim Palmer. The Orioles vaunted pitching had shut down the Pirates' powerful hitting in the first two games, and it had been especially effective against Willie Stargell, who was one for six with three strikeouts and three walks through two games. We didn't want him to get hot. See, when you get walked and he gets anxious, we knew he would chase. We stayed away from Willie uh, because I think that was around the time that he just began to pull the ball a lot more. And we stayed away from him, especially the left-handers, and we threw him a lot of off-speed pitches. And he wasn't that patient enough uh, to wait. Plus, he was a lot younger, and he had not reached the, matur he had not reached the maturity yet as the great hitter that he became. Um, even though he, he had a good year, he still was not uh, mature enough to make the adjustment, especially in that shorter series. Uh, he never really made the adjustment. But the rest of the lineup and the Pirates pitching staff would make plenty of adjustments as the series shifted back to Three Rivers Stadium. Even down two games to none, the Pirates felt at least reasonably confident with the series shifting back to Pittsburgh for game three. I think we were all looking forward to getting back to Pittsburgh, and I think that, that third game was so big, uh, we had to win that one. You, you can't let yourself get caught up in that. So you can't say, oh my goodness, if we lose another one, then we'll win one game away. Uh, there, there's so many cliches in baseball, and one of the reasons they're cliches is that they're true. You, you can't dwell on that, or, or, or you're intruding on your preparation for the next game. We didn't think anybody could beat us. You know, uh, we didn't think anybody was good enough to beat us over a period of time. If we had to play seven games, we we're going to win four of them. You know, and that's the attitude that we took. Well, it's like Murtaugh said. Uh, you know, it, it's the Pirates are not dead yet. After we won the first two games, they said, well, let's go over here, and if we come out of here with one, it's over. I never was that confident that I felt that we would sweep them because I had a lot of respect for those guys 
uh, as a unit. I had played in National League before. I knew the Pirates a long time ago, and Pirates have always been able to come back, even when you think you're down, get up, dust the dust off, and come back stronger, which they did. After the second game, I have like a 300 sport rider beside me. I said, I don't worry. He said, what is Steve Blass going to pitch and pitch me? Blass had been battered in his two starts in the NLCS. I did sit down and have a pretty serious conference with myself. I said, listen, this is not the way you pitch. You're not a power guy and everything, so you got to get back to where you were. And I think that little conference helped me in the World Series. He also disregarded the Pirates' scouting reports and the Orioles' hitters, though not necessarily by choice. We got a scouting report from Howie Hake and, and Pete Peterson, who are our scouts. They read them to us, and then I didn't pitch the first two games, so I'm sitting there with a, with a, you know, a, a notepad, and I'm making notes. First game, they get something like 17 singles. Second game, they hit seven or eight home runs. I said, what am I dealing with here? And then, uh, as fate would have it, I left my uh, notepad in, in, over in the top of the locker at Baltimore's Memorial Stadium. So it really didn't matter anyway. We have a discarded report. And then we was pitching Acuerdo with a discarded report. And then the Nimerta said, we don't going to go to no more discarded report. We're going to play the way the Pittsburgh Pirates play. Glass set the tone right away in game three. I don't know what's going to happen. I just come off two games where I got my head handed to me. And uh, so you go out there and, and you hope your stuff is, is where you want it to be, what you want it to be early, so you can get locked in. And, and it did. It came very quickly. I didn't make too many bad pitches, not too many mistakes. Robertson's three-run homer and Blass's complete game performance powered the Bucks to a 5-1 to one win. Now down two games to one, they were about to make history. Game four at Three Rivers Stadium was to be the first night game ever played in the World Series. Well, it was kind of neat being in the first night game World Series ever played. We knew it wasn't going to be the last, but uh, that trend was taking over, but we were the first ones to do it. That was kind of exciting. Growing up, every World Series game is always a day game. And, uh, you know, if you're in school, you're mad, and you listen to it on the radio if the teacher will let you. And then, uh, uh, of course, the weekends is what the ones you could watch. Well, this was the first night game, and it was gonna, everybody was going to be able to see it. And it, it was made a big deal, and we were excited about it, yeah. One of the things I was, I was thinking about was, hey, there's, there's more people going to get a chance to see us play tonight than any other time in the, in the history of the game. They said that there were so many people tuning in that, I mean, it was a record number of people. And it, it was great for baseball because now people got a chance to get off work, come home, have dinner, sit down, relax, and watch the ball game. But with the series hanging in the balance, the Pirates would get off to a poor start in game four. Down two games to one, and with a national audience watching the first World Series game ever played at night, Pirate starter Luke Walker got off to a terrible start. Luke Walker, uh had as good a stuff as any left-hander, I think, in, in the league, with maybe an exception of Carlton or somebody like that. Luke Walker would throw 20 minutes of batting practice to our guys, and he would throw a two-hitter. <laughs> and he's trying to throw batting practice. Never could throw a ball straight, and he started that game, and he got knocked around right away. You know, we could have broke that game wide open right there early, early on, and uh, that, that, would have, that might have changed the whole tempo, you know, of the World Series. You know, it's hard to say what would have happened if Frank Robinson would have hit a grand slam or we, behind me if he would have come up and he would have hit a three-run homer or something. And we go in there, we go in there with a 5 nothing lead, you know, and we go ahead. It's usually when you get five, our pitching staff had five runs, you were in big trouble. And it didn't matter who you were. Walker lasted just two-thirds of an inning and gave up three runs before being pulled for 21-year-old Bruce Keeson. We had a left-handed pitcher, so their lineup was probably set up more for a, a lefty lineup-wise. I don't think they had that many platoon situations, but based on my first game where I walked two guys I faced, it showed that Danny had some confidence in me to bring me in. Murchaw made a great move. He 
uh, Luke Walker didn't have his stuff and brought Keeson right into the ball game. A kid uh, with hardly any experience in the big leagues. Baltimore probably didn't know Bruce Keeson. He came up that year, came up I think in July. We all knew him and we knew how uh, aggressive he was and how good his stuff was and how fearless he was. We knew we had him, they didn't. And he went out there and he was just awesome. He was unbelievable. That fastball was moving so good and the slider was sharp and hard. The relief was the fact that hey, I actually got somebody out. Then I got into a groove, so to speak, and uh, it just went from there. Keeson pitched six and a third innings of scoreless ball. He hit more batters, a World Series record three, then he allowed hits, giving up just one. Bruce Keeson hits Frank Robinson in the stomach. How do you get a guy in the stomach? I never could figure that out. Meanwhile, Al Oliver drove in a run off Pat Dobson in the first. It was a tough at bat. I was battling. And he'd make some good pitches. That was a bloop hit. Didn't get many of those throughout my career. I'd love to have got more. But that was one bloop hit that I was proud of. Down 3-2 in the third, the Pirates appeared to have the lead on a two-run homer by Roberto Clemente. Murtaugh's arguing, and of course Roberto is standing there basically wondering what's going on. There are guys out in our bullpen saying the ball was fair, and all of a sudden everything stopped. Now we're back to playing ball. Roberto comes up, hits a line drive. I said, okay. See, that's how great he was. See, that would have thrown most hitters off. But he was focused. He was focused. And so was Oliver, who followed with an RBI single to tie the game. I knew they liked to throw me fastballs inside off the plate. And then go away. They wanted me to chase the pitch up and in, if at all possible. But this pitch wasn't necessarily up enough. It was down, and most left-handed hitters like the ball down and in. And so it was down enough where I was able to turn on it. The game stayed tied until Murtaugh called on another 21-year-old rookie, Milt May, to pinch hit with two out in the bottom of the seventh. And I remember the adrenaline. I used a, a big bat. I used a K-44 about 35, 34, 35, 35. And uh, Stargell also used a K-44. His was 36, 36, or in that, a little bit heavier than mine. And I can remember uh, going in the bat rack and picking out my bat, and it felt like a toothpick when I, I said, you know, I couldn't even feel it. So I said, I, you know, I'm, which had happened before, I've used Willie's. So I pulled out Willie's, which was a little bigger, and it felt, felt comfortable. And that was neat stand on third base. I mean, it's, it's a night game. First World Series night game in Major League Baseball. And there I'm standing over at third base. The knees are shaking. It's the, it's the whole deal, which, you know, if somebody says or not, the, the pinch hit in that situation. I don't care if you're 20 or 40. Uh, but I wanted to take a pitch. Uh, I didn't want to really because I knew I had the adrenaline going. I wanted to see a pitch. And uh, I, I took the first pitch, and it was a ball, which I was glad. That, and after that pitch, I really settled in. I really calmed down because I saw the ball real good. And I didn't hit a, the ball real hard, but I was fortunate and, and got a little blooper over second. And with the lead at 4-3, closer Dave Justy came on to seal the win. When I got uh, Boog Powell to pop up, and he threw his bat whenever, and, and uh, I, I just knew that I had him. Uh, it was a good pitch that I threw. My, the fastball was moving a little bit more than usual, and I knew that. Now I'm saying to myself, hey, if you're going to get these guys out, you, you're going to have to throw the strikes and get ahead of the, each hitter, get strike one and, and go accordingly. It went accordingly, and with their 4-3 to three win, the Pirates had tied the series at two games apiece. And in game five, Bob Robertson staked the Pirates to an early 1-0 lead with a solo homer off Dave McNally in the second. I still remember seeing that pitch come in, and I still remember me getting on top of it. And it was one of them high ones out there, you know, and then like that. And seeing Paul Blair out there, all he did was just kind of look up. And then I go, my little Babe Ruth trot around 
going to basis, you know. And they got back and the guy shook my hand and that kind of stuff. It was pretty neat. And the Pirates added three more runs in support of Nellie Bryles, who pitched a brilliant two-hit shutout. Now, Nellie is one of those guys, control pitcher, tries to keep the ball down. He just jumps at you, more or less. And uh, he uh, just had an outstanding performance that day against us. Falling on his face with his follow-through and brushing the dirt off him, but uh, he just shut them down. I mean, this, 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 this is three games, games three, four, and five, where the pitching of the Pirates dominated those four 20-game winners. Well, all of a sudden, we went into a funk, kind of like we won the first two ball games here. And then we go over there and we just, we flatten, we just went. But back in Baltimore, the Orioles rallied for single runs in the sixth and seventh innings to tie game six at two. Then won it on a Brooks Robinson sacrifice fly in the 10th. Bob Miller was pitching, uh, and I knew Bob uh, many, many years, and uh, we had a real battle. I fouled off a few balls, and the ball I hit the center field was a short fly ball, really, and Davalito was playing center field, and Frank Robinson was at third base. Frank uh, had a, a, a great play to get from first to third, I think, on a ball, and just barely made it into third base, and it's a short fly ball, and Davalito caught it, Frank tied up and tagged up, and then the throw home kind of hit on the mound, the back part of the mound, and kind of gave a little hop up in the air, and that was really the, the key to the whole play. And with the World Series tied at three games, the champion would be crowned in a decisive seventh game in Baltimore. It was midway through game six when Danny Murtaugh told Steve Blass he would start game seven if the Pirates lost. You talk about a sleepless night, very sleepless night to the degree that uh, my kids were up in Connecticut with, with my wife and, and, uh, and my mom. So after that sixth game, I got nowhere. I'm by myself. And there was nobody there family-wise, which is unusual. So I'm looking around the hotel in Baltimore for you know, somebody to go have dinner with. And I see Keeson come through. I said, Bruce, you got anything going on? You want to get something to eat? Yeah. So we go out to eat. And I realize after about an hour and a half, we're sitting there having dinner. We have not said one word to each other. And then it came to me, listen, I'm pitching the seventh game of the World Series tomorrow, and he's getting married. He wasn't going to give me any advice, and I sure as hell wasn't going to give him any. <laughs> so I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning in Baltimore, couldn't go back to sleep, just got dressed and wound up walking around the street, and had a cop come up and ask me what I was doing. What do you think? All right, here's some vagrant wandering around the streets of Baltimore. <laughs> Let's, we can either run him in, or, or if he sounds legitimate, we send him back to his hotel. Yeah, I got rousted out by a cop the night before the pitch the seventh game of the World Series. The Orioles countered with 20-game winning left-hander Mike Cuellar. I felt that Cuellar was better than their starter. We still had the advantage of the matchup that was in our favor at home. And the Orioles probably felt more confident when a shaky blast took the mound in the first inning. I could not get focused and I was throwing the ball all over the plate. All over the place. And I, I said, oh, come on, you gotta get it together. You gotta get it together. And that's when my friend, Mr. Weaver, called timeout and said, Rule 801, 801, he's not pitching from uh, full contact with the mound. He argued for about 15 minutes and I got so upset with him that I think it took my mind off the immensity of the occasion. <laughs> and uh, got locked in from there. But every time I see Earl, I thank him for helping me uh, get it back together. And Blass was dominant from that moment onward. He didn't throw very many pitches over the middle of the plate. Most of it was sliders away and fastballs in. Uh, you know, he was never really in very much trouble. Steve Blass could not have pitched a better game. Good control, uh, made you hit the ball, didn't walk anyone, and uh, he was their best pitcher. He just kept flipping that little old breaking ball up there, and he just, and it wasn't, it wasn't a great breaking ball. I mean, it was a good breaking ball, but he just, he just kept spinning it up there. And nobody could hit it. The game was scoreless until Roberto Clemente dug in against Cuellar in the fourth inning. He said, my Cuellar going to start to pitch me over my head up, and I'm going to take him deep to left center.
Clemente's World Series hitting streak had reached 14 games, and it remained 1-0 until the eighth, when Jose Pagan came up with Willie Stargell on first. And I saw where Redmond was playing in center field. And it was, the pitch was on its way. And in my mind, I knew he was out of position. And had, had he missed that pitch or fouled it off or whatever, took it, I probably, from behind the plate, would have moved Redmond a little bit more to its center field because he was shading him to right center. They had the hit and run on with Willie. And Pagan hit a double to left center field. And I think it was Merv Redmond that went out, got the ball up, couldn't get the handle. Lost the handle one time, and I still think that's the difference in that run, and maybe the difference in the game, maybe the difference in the World Series. If he gets that clean, they got a chance to get Willie, because Willie's coming around from first base, and Willie is losing ground. You know, Willie wasn't going to win too many races. He comes around third base, and you know it ain't going to be a slide at home play. It's going to be a surrender. <laughs> so, and he slides in under it. The run proved to be important because the Orioles scored in the bottom of the eighth to cut the lead to two to one. So we go in the top of the ninth inning. I cannot sit still. I'm not, I'm, I ain't never going to be able to sit on that bench. So I wander into our clubhouse, and there's Bob Prince in there. The Gunner's in there, apparently setting up, getting ready to do interviews if, if we win. But I'm, I'm so locked in, I, I'm startled. I said, Bob, what are you doing in there? He says, me? What the hell are you doing in here? Get back out there. So, so I'm pacing back and forth. And then I went out, and uh, I mean, the heart of their, their batting order up, uh, Boog Powell, uh, Frank Robinson and Merv Redman and uh, threw a good pitch to Boog Powell, got a ground ball at second base. And then uh, I made a real bad mistake to Frank Robinson. I hung a slider just like I had in game three right there and popped it up. Popped up to short, got lucky. So with two out, Merv Redman was up. Redman had singled up the middle in game six. And so shortstop Jackie Hernandez, the man Orioles manager Earl Weaver said wasn't a championship shortstop, shaded Redman towards second base. But in the end, you know, it worked out. I moved out two, two step farther and I catch the ball right in front of me. So it worked out the way the scouting report was. He had a heart of a, of a lion, and he played some great baseball for us. Well, Earl, we have said a lot of things he regrets, but that was one he'll never forget. I just put my arms up. I said, the world champs. That's exactly what I said. And by the time I did that, I look over here, and here comes somebody flying over to me, which is blast. I mean, legs up in the air. Then he wrapped his legs around me. You turn into a 10-year-old kid. You won the World Series. You've been dreaming about it since you're eight years old. You finally get a chance to live it. I mean, so it's, it goes, you go berserk. You don't know what you're going to do. You just you, you jump up and down. And you scream. You find somebody to holler at and jump on. And Oh, it's wonderful. I jump up on Bob Robertson, and, and everybody's running around. It was chaos. It was, it was absolutely amazing, the feeling that you had. You can't. You, I don't know if anybody can express it unless they've been there adequately, you know, express it adequately. It's just, the feeling is incredible. As the 1971 World Series unfolded, it became clear to a national audience just how great a player Roberto Clemente was. From his unbelievable arm to his daring on the base paths, and his 414 batting average, the 37-year-old series MVP was magnificent. Roberto just was off the radar. I was just so glad for him to have shown the whole world how great a player and leader he was. You know, he carried us on his back. To have everybody around the baseball world see what we had been seeing around Pittsburgh for all these years, it was, it was phenomenal. It was, it was, it was his World Series. A lot of people didn't know who he was because of you know, the fact that Pittsburgh doesn't get much notoriety from, from the media, whatever, nationally. And uh, finally people said, well, it was like some of the, some of the Baltimore Orioles players said after, after the game, after maybe a couple of days after, that I didn't know how good he was until I saw him play. And that kind of sums it up. Here it is, the showcase of baseball. You got people tuning in. Who, who are not even baseball fans, but it's the World Series. And to have him do those very things that you knew he always did against you in, that, in a World Series was just more impressive than anything else. And uh, he showed his arm off, he showed his power off, he just showed what a great player that he was. 
Meanwhile, across the hall, the heavily favored Orioles were experiencing different emotions. Losing the seventh game of the World Series is not any fun, but, and plus we were at home, and we were really uh, ready to celebrate too. We were going to celebrate. I, I thought we were going to win, you know? And if we were just, we weren't very far from winning. I mean, we were like two runs away from winning. It just didn't happen, and it's, all of a sudden you get in the clubhouse and you realize that, hey, we didn't win. I remember I, I just died inside, you know, and I went inside, and that was the toughest game. In all 20 years of playing baseball, that was the toughest game in, in my career. In that clubhouse, we all came in, and, you, and you're so quiet. I mean, you can listen to your whiskers grow. I remember staying there for hours after the game, just in my locker. And uh, I replayed the game and uh, figured out how we could have won or, you know, maybe we should have won and why it didn't happen. And, and no matter how many times I tried, uh, Pittsburgh still came out in, on top. And the city of Pittsburgh was ready to welcome home their conquering heroes. To get on the airplane and unbeknownst to me, uh, Roberto and Vera Clemente are sitting about halfway back. And before we take off, he comes up the aisle and he, he calls me out to the aisle and he gives me a, a big hug. I will never forget that as long as I live. I get goosebumps talking about it. I wish there was a longer flight. You know, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, it's up and down. You know, I wish there was a flight where it was like three hours long. You could have enjoyed it. That was a five hour trip from the airport to, to Three River Stadium. Manny Sanguian's wife lost her wig, but somebody pulled it right off her head. <laughs> These are things that I remember after the game was over, after we, we touched down. I've never seen so many people come out to, to uh, welcome a team in my life. They had people lined up from the airport all the way to downtown. It was unbelievable. And finally, when we got to the Fort Pitt Tunnel and through, it was like a sea of people. The law enforcement could no longer control the people. That, that, that was something. That was something. I mean, I had the arms of my suit snatched off. The arms of the suit, gone, just yanked off. Like I had a vest on when it was like this. It was gone, it was gone. I don't remember getting home, how I got home, who I got home with. It was, it was chaos, but it was fun. <laughs> Believe me, it was fun. Difficult times lay ahead for the Pirates. The passing of Roberto Clemente meant the mantle of leadership moved on to Willie Stargell. And though the team was successful throughout the decade of the 1970s, getting back to the NLCS three times, they never advanced to the World Series again until 1979, when Stargell led a new cast of Pirates to the promised land. Along the way, he and his teammates learned how difficult it is and how sweet it is to win it all. And tonight's first pitch, Steve Lass and Manny Sanguian. How about a big round of applause for all the 1971 world champion Pittsburgh Pirates? <laughs> 